Shadow of Man, Chapter 10, The Hierarchy Mike's rise to the number one or top-ranking position in the chimpanzee community was both interesting and spectacular. In 1965, Mike had ranked almost bottom in the adult male dominance hierarchy. He'd been the last to gain access to bananas and had been threatened and actually attacked by almost every other adult male. Indeed, at one time, he had appeared almost bald from losing so many handfuls of hair during aggressive incidents with his fellow apes. When Hugo and I had left the Gombe stream at the end of that year, prior to getting married, Mike's position hadn't changed. Yet when we returned four months later, we found a very different Mike. Chris and Dominic told us the beginning of his story, how he had started to use empty four-gallon paraffin cans more and more often during his charging displays. We didn't have to wait many days before we witnessed Mike's techniques for ourselves. There was one incident that I remember particularly vividly. A group of five adult males, including top-ranking Goliath, David Greybeard and the huge Rodolph, were grooming each other. The session had been going on for some 20 minutes. Mike was sitting on his own, about 30 yards from them, frequently staring towards the group, occasionally idly grooming himself. All at once, Mike calmly walked over to our tent and took hold of an empty paraffin can by the handle. Then he picked up a second can and, walking upright, returned to the place where he'd been sitting before. Armed with his two cans, Mike continued to stare towards the other males, and after a few moments he began to rock from side to side. At first the movement was almost imperceptible, but Hugo and I were watching him closely. Gradually he rocked more vigorously. His hair slowly began to stand on end, and then, softly at first, he started a series of pantoots. As he called, Mike got to his feet, and suddenly Mike was off, charging towards the group, hitting the two cans ahead of him. The cans, together with Mike's crescendo of hooting, made the most appalling racket. No wonder the erstwhile peaceful males rushed out of the way. Mike and his cans vanished down a track and after a few moments there was silence. Some of the males reassembled and resumed their interrupted grooming session, but the others stood around somewhat apprehensively. After a short interval, that low-pitched hooting began again, followed almost immediately by the appearance of the two rackety cans with Mike close behind them. Straight for the other males he charged, and once more they fled. This time, even before the group could reassemble, Mike set off yet again, but he made straight for Goliath, and even Goliath hastened out of Mike's way, like all the others. Then Mike stopped and sat, all his hair still on end, and breathing hard. His eyes glared ahead, and his lower lip was hanging slightly down, so that the pink inside showed brightly, and gave him a wild appearance. Rodolph was the first of the males to approach Mike, uttering soft pant grunts of submission, crouching low and pressing his lips to Mike's thigh. Then he began to groom Mike, and two other males approached, pant grunting, and began to groom him also. Finally, David Greybeard went over to Mike, laid one hand on his groin, and joined in the grooming. Only Goliath kept away, sitting on his own, and staring towards Mike. It was obvious that Mike constituted a serious threat to Goliath's hitherto unchallenged supremacy. Mike's deliberate use of man-made objects was probably an indication of superior intelligence. Many of the adult males had, at some time or another, dragged a paraffin can to enhance their charging displays in place of the more normal branches or rocks. But only Mike, apparently, had been able to profit from the chance experience and learn to seek out the cans deliberately to his own advantage. The cans, of course, made a great deal more noise than a branch when dragged along the ground at speed. And after a while, 
Mike was actually able to keep three cans ahead of him at once for about 60 yards as he ran flat out across the camp clearing. No wonder that males, previously his superiors, rushed out of Mike's way. Charging displays usually occur when a chimpanzee becomes emotionally excited, when he arrives at a food source, joins up with another group, or when he's frustrated. But it seemed that Mike actually planned his charging displays, almost, one might say, in cold blood. Often when he got up to fetch his cans, he showed no visible signs of frustration or excitement. That came afterwards, when, armed with his display props, he began to rock from side to side, raise his hair and hoot. Eventually, Mike's use of paraffin cans became dangerous, for he learned to hurl them ahead of him at the close of a charge, once he got me on the back of my head, and once he hit Hugo's precious film camera. We decided to remove all the cans, and for a while went through a nightmare period, since Mike tried to drag about all manner of other objects, once he got hold of Hugo's tripod, luckily when the camera wasn't mounted. Once he managed to grab and pull down the large cupboard in which we kept a good deal of food and all our crockery and cutlery. The noise and the trail of destruction were unbelievable. Finally, however, we managed to dig things into the ground or hide them away, and Mike had to resort to branches and rocks like his companions. By that time, however, his top-ranking status was assured, although it was fully another year before Mike himself seemed to feel quite secure in his position. He continued to display very frequently and vigorously, and the lower-ranking chimps had increasing reason to fear him, for he often would attack a female or youngster viciously at the slightest provocation. In particular, as might be expected, a very tense relationship prevailed between Mike and the ex-dominant male, Goliath. Goliath didn't relinquish his position without a struggle. His displays also increased in frequency and vigour, and he too became more aggressive. Indeed, there was a time towards the start of this battle for dominance when Hugo and I feared for Goliath's sanity. After attacking a couple of youngsters and charging back and forth, dragging huge branches, he would sit, his hair on end, his sides heaving from exertion, a froth of saliva gleaming at his half-open mouth, and a glint in his eyes that to us looked not far from madness. We actually had a world mesh iron cage built in Kigoma, and when this had been set up in camp, we retreated inside when Goliath's temper was at its worst. Remember, they're eight times stronger than we are. One day, when Mike was sitting in camp, a series of distinctive, rather melodious pantoots with characteristic quavers at the close announced the return of Goliath who for two weeks had been somewhere down in the south of the reserve. Mike responded immediately, hooting himself and charging across the clearing. And he climbed a tree and sat staring over the valley, every hair on end. A few minutes later, Goliath appeared, and as he reached the outskirts of the camp clearing, he commenced one of his spectacular displays. He must have seen Mike, for he headed straight for him, dragging a huge branch. Then he leapt up into a tree near that of Mike and was still. For a moment, Mike stared towards him, and then he too began to display, swaying the branches of his tree, swinging to the ground, hurling a few rocks, and finally climbing up into Goliath's tree and swaying the branches there. When he stopped, Goliath immediately reciprocated, swinging about in the tree and rocking the branches himself. Presently, as one of his wild leaps took him quite close to Mike, Mike too displayed, and for a few unbelievable moments, both of the splendid male chimpanzees were swaying branches within a few feet of each other, until I thought the whole tree must crash to the ground. But an instant later, both chimps stopped and sat, staring at each other. It was Goliath who moved next, standing upright as he rocked a sapling. When he paused, Mike charged past him, hurling a rock and drumming with his feet on the trunk of a tree. 
This went on for nearly half an hour. First one male and then the other displayed, and each performance seemed to be more vigorous, more spectacular than that preceding it. Yet during all this time, apart from occasionally hitting one another with the ends of the branches they swayed, neither chimpanzee actually attacked the other. Suddenly, after an extra long pause, it seemed that Goliath's nerve broke. He rushed up to Mike, crouched beside him with loud, nervous pant grunts, and began to groom him with feverish intensity. For a few moments, Mike ignored Goliath completely. Then he turned and, with a vigour almost matching that of Goliath, began to groom his vanquished rival. And there they sat, grooming each other without pause, for over an hour. That was the last real duel between the two males. From then on, it seemed that Goliath accepted Mike's superiority, and a strangely intense relationship grew up between the two. They often greeted one another with much display of emotion, embracing or patting one another, kissing each other in the neck, after which they usually started grooming each other. During these grooming sessions, it appeared that the tension between them was eased, soothed by the close, friendly physical contact. Afterwards, they sometimes fed or rested quite close to each other, looking peaceful and relaxed, as though the bitter rivalry of the past had never been. Indeed, it is one of the most striking aspects of chimpanzee society that creatures who can so quickly become roused to frenzies of excitement and aggression can, for the most part, maintain such relaxed and friendly relationships with each other. One day, I followed Mike from camp over the stream and for some way into the thick forest of the opposite mountain slope. With Mike were the old male JB and Flo with Flint, Fifi and Figgin. Eventually they stopped under some trees in one of those places where chimps love to rest during the heat of the day. I sat down nearby. Fifi climbed high up into the tree and made herself a little nest. Figgin and JB snoozed on the ground. Flo, with Flint sleeping on her lap, sat grooming Mike. After a while, they too lay down to rest. Presently, Mike reached out towards Flo's hand and began almost imperceptibly to play with her fingers. Soon she responded, gently grasping his hand, twisting and pulling away, only to reach out and grasp it again. After a few minutes, Mike sat up and leaned over Flo, tickling her neck and her so ticklish groin, until, protecting Flint with one hand and parrying Mike with the other, Flo started to shake with panting gasps of chimpanzee laughter. After a while, she could stand it no longer and rolled away from him. But she was roused, this ancient female, with her stumps of teeth, and soon she was tickling Mike in the ribs with her bony fingers. Then it was Mike's turn to laugh and reach to grab her hands and tickle her again himself. After ten minutes, Flo, it seemed, could endure the tickling lo no longer, and she moved away, leaving Mike stretched out with a benign expression on his face. And yet, just two hours earlier, this same male had attacked Flo savagely, dropping a huge pile of his own bananas and pounding the old female unmercifully, just because she had presumed to take a few fruits for herself from a nearby box. How was it possible for her to enjoy such a relaxed interaction with Mike so soon? The secret, perhaps, lies in the fact that whilst a male chimpanzee is quick to threaten or attack a subordinate, he is usually equally quick to calm his victim with a touch, a pat on the back, an embrace of reassurance. And Flo, after Mike's vicious attack, and even while her hand dripped blood where she'd scraped it against a rock, had hurried after Mike, screaming in her hoarse voice until he had turned. Then, as she approached him, crouched low in apprehension, he had patted her again and again on the head, and as she quietened, had given her a final reassurance by leaning forward to press his lips to her brow. Would Mike have become the top-ranking male if I and my paraffin cans had never invaded the Gombe stream? We shall never know, of course, but I suspect he would have in the end. 
for Mike has a strong desire for dominance, a characteristic marked in some individuals and almost entirely lacking in others. Over and above which, Mike has unquestionable intelligence, an amazing courage too. I shall never forget the time soon after Mike had become the uneasy top-ranking male, when some of the other high-ranking males turned on him. Mike had charged into camp, held a few rocks, and in passing briefly pounded on David Greybeard. David Greybeard in some ways was a coward, for he nearly always tried to avoid trouble, and when he couldn't, he usually tried to hide behind a higher-ranking companion, especially Goliath. But when he became really roused, he could be a very dangerous chimpanzee. On this occasion, David, after running, screaming away from Mike, turned and began to utter loud, fierce-sounding war barks. He hurried over to Goliath and embraced him, then turned and again shouted towards Mike. By this time, Hugo and I knew David well, and it was obvious that he was furious. Suddenly, David ran forward a short way towards Mike, and immediately Goliath joined him, aiding his own fierce call to that of his friend. Mike began to display, charging across the clearing towards another group of males. They fled screaming, but then, as David and Goliath were still calling, they joined in too. Now it was five strong adult males, including the once top-ranking Goliath, against one, against Mike. Again, Mike charged across the clearing, and all at once, with David in the lead, the others were after him. Mike, screaming now, rushed up a tree, and the others followed. Hugo and I felt sure this was the showdown. Now, Goliath would regain his lost position. Suddenly, to our amazement, Mike turned. Instead of leaping off into the next tree and running away, he turned. He was still screaming, but he began to sway branches violently, and the next moment he took a leap towards the fire. In a flurry of fright, they rushed down the tree, almost falling over one another in their haste, and fled with Mike after them. When Mike sat, his hair on end, his eyes glaring, the others stayed away from him, cowed. Mike had won a spectacular victory by bluff. When I refer to Mike as the dominant male, what I really mean is that he became top ranking amongst those individuals that we know, individuals whose normal range includes our home valley. Once I'd become really familiar with all the chimpanzees of our community, I quickly realized from visits to the north and south of the reserve that there are in fact two other communities. Many of the individuals comprising these groups seldom or never travel as far as our centrally located valley, but there is without doubt some intermixing between chimpanzees of the three communities. One fully mature male, whose normal range so far as we know lay to the south, did start to visit our feeding station. He would come for a week or so at a time when he was in the vicinity and then disappear back to his normal haunts. Just before he died, he became quite a regular visitor to camp, but his relationship with the males of our group was always rather tense. Quite often, females from the northern or southern communities arrive at camp during their periods of sexual swelling, brought along by our males. And once they've discovered bananas, some of them become fairly regular visitors, whilst others come only once or twice a year. On a number of occasions, I've seen individuals from two of these main communities meet up and mingle without aggression, feeding together side by side. But it seems that Mike himself is reluctant to mix with the chimps to the north and the south of his domain. A few times when strangers called from a neighbouring valley, Mike, after much displaying and calling himself, turned back, taking some of his group with him whilst others moved on, on to mix with the strangers. A chimpanzee community is an extremely complex social organisation. It was only when a large number of individuals began to visit the feeding area so that I could make regular observations on their interactions, one with another, that I began to appreciate just how complex it is. The members who comprise it 
move about in constantly changing associations. And yet, though the society seems to be organized in such a casual manner, each individual knows his place in the social structure, knows his status in relation to any other chimpanzee he may chance upon during the day. Small wonder there's such a wide range of greeting gestures and that most chimpanzees do greet each other when they meet after a separation. Figan going up to an older male with a submissive pant front is probably affirming that he remembers quite well a little aggressive incident of two days before when he was thumped soundly on the back. I know you're dominant, I admit it, I remember. It's a sort of communication inherent in his submissive greeting. I acknowledge your respect, I shall not attack you just now, is implicit in the gentle patting movement of Mike's hand as he greets a submissive female. As Hugo and I became increasingly familiar with Mike's community, we began to learn more and more about the variety of relationships which existed between different adult chimpanzees. Some individuals only interacted when chance, such as a fruiting tree or a sexually attractive female, threw them together. Others moved about together frequently and showed an affectionate tolerance and regard for each other, which we felt could best be described as friendship. And as our study continued, we found that some friendships persisted over the years, whilst others were of relatively short duration. We learned too to appreciate the different characteristics of male and female chimpanzees. And the more we learned, the more we were impressed by the obvious parallels between some chimpanzee and some human relationships. Firm friendships like that between Goliath and David Greybeard seem to be particularly prevalent among male chimpanzees. Mike and the irascible, testy old JB travelled about in the same group very frequently. When I first knew them, JB was the higher ranking of the two, but Mike's strategies with the paraffin cans served to subordinate JB along with all the other males. However, once things had settled down, with Mike secure in the top ranking position, it became apparent that JB had also risen in the social ladder. When he was in a group with Mike, JB was able to dominate Goliath, as well as other males who had held a higher rank than he before Mike's rise. These other males quickly accepted JB as second to Mike, but Goliath asserted his old superiority over JB on many occasions when Mike was not part of the group. I well remember one day when Goliath threatened JB, who had approached his box of bananas. JB had once moved away, but then began to scream loudly, looking across the valley in the direction which Mike had taken earlier. Mike must have been quite close, because within a few minutes he appeared, his hair on end, looking round to see what had upset his friend. Then JB ran towards the box where Goliath sat, and Goliath, with submissive pantomimes, hastened to vacate his place, even though Mike took no further active part in the dispute. There was another occasion when, after eating about 20 bananas, JB tried hard to break open another box. As he was a past master at breaking boxes, and as they were hard to mend, Hugo and I tried to dissuade him from the idea by walking slowly to the box and sitting on it. JB did indeed move away, but then he climbed a nearby tree and screamed, again staring in the direction taken by Mike when he had left earlier. That time, however, perhaps luckily for us, Mike must have been out of earshot, for he did not come back. Leaky and Mr. Wurzel were two other males who very frequently travelled together. In temperament, they were very different. Leaky, like his namesake, is robust, high-ranking and usually good-natured. Mr. Wurzel, on the other hand, was always nervous, both in his dealings with other chimps and with humans. He was very low ranking indeed, and even before he became really decrepit prior to his death, was subordinate to all the other adult males, and even some of the adolescent males. Nevertheless, 
The two spent hours in each other's company, grooming each other, feeding and moving from place to place together. When Leakey was with him, Mr. Wurzel always seemed far more relaxed and confident. Friendships of this sort are beneficial not only to the lower ranking of the pair. One day, during the period when Goliath was losing his top-ranking position, he arrived in camp on his own. He was tense and obviously anxious about something. Every so often he stood upright to stare back along the way whence he had come, and he jumped at every sudden sound. All at once Hugo and I noticed three males, one of whom was the high-ranking Hugh from the southern community, standing at the top of a slight rise and looking towards Goliath. They all had their hair slightly on end, and as they began running down the slope, they reminded us of a gang of thunks. Goliath didn't wait to see what they would do. With great speed, and very silently, he ran in the opposite direction and vanished into the thick vegetation surrounding camp. The three rushed after him, and for the next five minutes they bustled about, noisily in the undergrowth, obviously searching for Goliath. They were unsuccessful, and presently they emerged and began to eat bananas. Suddenly, Hugo pointed, and there, a short way up the slope, I saw a head peeping cautiously from behind a tree trunk. Goliath. Every time one of the three looked up, Goliath bobbed back behind his tree, only to peer out after a few moments. Presently, we saw him moving off quietly up the slope. The chimp slept near camp that night. Very early, almost before it was light, we heard a sudden burst of pantooting from the direction of Goliath's nest. Hugh and the other two males were the first to arrive in camp, dark shapes in the grey light of dawn. Then, as they were eating bananas, we heard a sudden burst of calling from up the slope. A moment later, Goliath charged down, dragging a huge branch and hurling it forward as he crossed the clearing. Without pausing, he rushed at Hugh and began to attack him. It was a fierce battle, and Hugh came off very much the worst. Usually a male pounds his victim for a few seconds only, but this time the two combatants rolled over and over, grappling and hitting, and then Goliath managed to leap onto Hugh, hanging onto his shoulder hair and stamping on his back with both feet. It was just after the start of the fight that Hugo and I realised why Goliath was suddenly brave. We heard the deep, characteristic pant hoots of David Greybeard and glimpsed him charging in his slow and magnificent fashion across the clearing and past the battling males. David must have joined his friend early that morning and by his presence alone given Goliath the courage to face Hugh and his gang. With the exception of David and Goliath, who bore no resemblance at all to each other, we've been able to detect similarities in either physical makeup or behavioural characteristics or both in all the other pairs of male friends that we've known. This was particularly striking in the case of Leakey and Mr Wurzel. Mr Wurzel had extraordinary eyes, for the part around the iris was white instead of being heavily pigmented with brown, as in other chimpanzees. His eyes, therefore, exactly remembered those of a human. Leakey, too, showed the same unusual lack of pigmentation, though to a much lesser extent than Mr. Wurzel. We suspect, in fact, that pairs of male friends may often be siblings. The only two adult females we know who enjoyed this sort of friendship were almost certainly sisters. Not only did they look alike facially, but they had the same massive build, and both were prone to perform charging displays, stamping on the ground and swaggering in a manner more typical of males. They were the only two adult females I ever saw playing with each other, rolling about on the ground, tickling one another and panting with laughter, each with her infant cradled in one arm. The adult females of the chimpanzee community are almost always submissive to adult males, and indeed to many of the older adolescent males, but they have their own dominance hierarchy, of which Flo for many years was supreme, respected and even feared 
by old and young females alike. Flo was exceptionally aggressive towards her own sex, and she would tolerate no insubordination from young adolescent males. Much of her confidence, no doubt, resulted from the fact that she was so often accompanied by her two oldest sons. And with the aggressive Fifi as well, the family was formidable indeed. As mentioned earlier, Flo at one time often wandered about together with the mother Ollie, but their relationship was very different from that between Mike and JB, or David and Goliath. For one thing, Flo was frequently aggressive towards Ollie, and for another, neither would go to the assistance of the other in times of trouble. The only time I did see them united was when they ganged up on a young stranger female. This female had first appeared in camp surrounded by a retinue of males and boasting a pink swilling. She'd come in every day for 10 days and become quite used to the strange place where bananas grew in boxes on the ground. Often she'd been in camp at the same time as Flo and Ollie, but the two older females had seemed to ignore her completely. And then one day, when a small group of chimps, including Flo and Ollie, were in camp, Hugo and I saw the young stranger female. Her swelling had quite gone. She was sitting in a tree at the edge of the clearing, looking nervously towards us. We were pleased, for at that time only a very few young females visited the feeding area. Just as we were getting some bananas ready for her, we noticed Flo and Ollie staring fixedly at the stranger, every hair on their bodies bristling. It was Flo who took the first step forward, and Ollie followed. They went quietly and slowly towards the tree, and their victim failed to notice them until they were quite close. Then, with pants and squeaks of fear, she climbed higher in the branches. Flo and Ollie stood for a moment looking up, and then Flo shot up the tree, seized a branch to which the now screaming female was clinging, and, with her lips bunched in fury, shook it violently with both hands. Soon the youngster, half shaken, half leaping, scrambled into a neighbouring tree, with Flo hot on her heels and Ollie uttering loud war barks, following on the ground below. The chase went on until Flo forced the female to the ground, caught up with her, slammed down on her with both fists, and then, stamping her feet and slapping the ground with her hands, she chased her victim from the vicinity. Ollie, still barking in threat, ran behind. When the stranger had vanished along the forest track, Flo stopped. Her face was spattered with liquid dung, product of the young female's terror. Flo's hair was still bristling. Ollie stood beside her, and the two old females listened as the sounds of screaming gradually receded up the valley. Then Flo turned, wiped off the dung with a handful of leaves, and slowly returned to camp, where throughout the incident, Fifi had been looking after eight-month-old Flint. This was not the only occasion when we witnessed sudden alliances between two or more adult females, which resulted in driving young newcomers of the same sex away from the feeding area. We have not, however, seen them gang up in this way on stranger adolescent males, nor have we seen adult males of our group driving away strangers of either sex from the feeding area. What then motivates the aggressive behaviour of those females? Is it perhaps the fact that older females, who normally have a much smaller range than males, are more territorial? Or could it be due to the attention paid to young stranger females by their adult males? Are they, in other words, motivated by the emotion which in human beings we call jealousy? We cannot be sure sometimes it certainly seems like it. One day when Flo was socially grooming with four adult males, a young pregnant female arrived. She'd recently joined our group from the north. Pregnant females often continue to show monthly swellings, and this one had a very pink posterior. The males on this occasion didn't mate her, but they were nevertheless interested. They left Flo, hastened over to the newcomer, 
inspected her bottom and began to groom her vigorously. It was only a couple of minutes later that I noticed Flo. She had moved a few yards towards the young female and was standing, staring at her with every hair on end. Had she dared, she would, without doubt, have attacked the newcomer. As it was, she presently walked slowly over to the group and herself inspected the swelling carefully. Then she moved away and sat to groom Flint. We could scarcely believe it when the following day Flo showed the beginning of a swelling herself. Flint was under two years old, and whereas young females may start swelling again when their infants are only 14 months, old females like Flo do not normally become pink again for four or five years after giving birth. However, Flo's sex skin was swollen enough to arouse instant attention from Rodolphe, who feverishly pushed her to her feet and intently inspected her bottom. So did a couple of other males. Then they sat around grooming her. The next day, that extraordinary swelling had gone, nor did Flo show any sign of swelling again for the next four years. I cannot believe it was pure coincidence. The female chimpanzee is indeed very different from the male, although, as in the case of humans, some females show masculine characteristics and vice versa. Adult females typically resort to pleading with many of the gestures and calls made by infants when they are trying to get their own way with a social superior. Melissa, when begging from a male, reaches her hand out time and time again, touches him ingratiatingly, and if this behaviour fails, may start to whimper or even scream like a child in a tantrum. Like other females, she can be very persistent in her begging so that often she is eventually rewarded with a scrap of banana or cardboard or whatever it is that she wants. Once, when Mr. McGregor was grooming her, he turned to groom a higher-ranking male who joined the group. Melissa stared at his back for a while and then began rocking back and forth and whimpering. He ignored her. Her whimpers grew louder, and every so often she reached out and gave him a quick poke with her finger. Still, Mr. McGregor continued to groom the other male. Finally, almost screaming in her frustration, Melissa reached out and gave Mr. McGregor a hard shove with one foot, and at this the old male finally turned and began to groom the importunate female again. It appears that females are more likely than males to harbour grudges. At one time, Melissa, if she was threatened by a superior, nearly always hurried over to a higher-ranking individual and, whilst reaching out to touch him, directed loud screams towards her aggressor. Obviously, she was trying to incite her chosen champion to retaliate on her behalf. The fact that males she approached seldom responded, except perhaps to reassure the noisy female, in no way dampened her ardour. She did exactly the same the next time she was threatened. One day, when she was lightly cuffed by Rodolphe, it happened that he was the highest ranking male in the group. But to our astonishment, when Mike arrived some ten minutes later, Melissa rushed up to him, pressed her mouth to his neck, and then, with one hand on Mike's back, she started screaming while staring at Rodolphe and making little flapping movements towards him with her other hand. As usual, her stratagem was ignored, but we saw her behaving in exactly the same way on other occasions. She never gave up. Melissa was by no means the only female to nurse a grievance over a length of time. Pooch, almost certainly, lost her mother when she was between five and six years old, and she struck up a strange relationship with an old male, Huxley, for the most part, they paid little attention to each other, although sometimes they sat grooming together. But whenever Huxley got up to leave, Pooch followed like a shadow. One day, when a large group of chimps had visited camp, Pooch, who was about six years old at the time, stayed behind with young Everett, a year her senior, when the others left. Neither of the two had managed to get any bananas. As soon as the group was out of sight, we gave them some fruit. 
A squabble broke out, and Everett cuffed Pooch, who screamed. Then she turned her rump, presenting submissively. He patted her, and they sat peacefully side by side, feebly. We were astounded when Pooch, a few minutes later, suddenly dropped her bananas and attacked Everett, biting him and pulling at his hair. Everett was probably startled too, for it's unusual indeed for a female to attack a male older than herself. Then we realised what had prompted Pooch's behaviour. We saw old Huxley, his hair on end, standing a short way along the track, gazing towards us. His glance moved from Hugo and me to the youngsters. Probably he dissociated Pooch's earlier scream with us and for that reason hurried back to her rescue. A moment longer he stood and then charged down towards the squabbling chimps. It looked as though he cuffed them both, then he turned and plodded away. Everett screamed until he got cramps in his throat and sat doubled up as though in pain. Pooch immediately started after her protector, and as she passed Everett, she glanced at him with an expression I've never seen before or since in a chimpanzee. It looked exactly like the smirk a little human girl might be expected to give under similar circumstances. What Pooch did to Fifi a couple of years her junior, and a playmate of long standing, was completely against chimp etiquette. It happened when the two were romping together, and Fifi probably accidentally hurt Pooch, who screamed and hit at Fifi. Fifi grinned in fear, and then turned her rump submissively and presented to Pooch. Pooch should have reached out and touched Fifi's bottom. Instead, she leaned forward and quite deliberately and rather hard bit Fifi's little pointed clitoris. Fifi, with all her mother's staunchness of spirit, turned and flew at the larger female. The two rolled and grappled on the ground, pulling out handfuls of each other's hair until Flo finally arrived, her hair on end, and Pooch retreated, screaming. Fifi, her screeches cramping in her throat, presented again, this time to her mother. Flo reassured her, patting her rump again and again, until the child cried. But her bottom swelled up and bled a good deal. Obviously it was very painful, and she made herself a soft, leafy nest on the ground, where she reclined for a while, gently dabbing at her wound with a handful of leaves. There is indeed a great deal in chimpanzee social relationships to remind us of some of our own behaviour, more perhaps than many of us would care to admit. Only by carrying on our research for years to come and studying the social structure in a group where blood relations between the different individuals are known, shall we succeed in understanding the whole complex and intricate pattern.